The Atari Lynx was released at the end of the 80s. Back then, the screen was amazing, but it doesn't hold up to modern standards. So we're going to upgrade this kitty cat with this modern screen from Ben Venn. And we're going to do it right now. Let's get this Lynx open. First we need to remove the rubber grips if your Lynx still has them. I'm using a plastic spudger so I don't tear or cut into the rubber. There are four outer screws on the back. Removing the battery compartment cover allows us to lift off the back of the Lynx. This gives us easier access to the screw securing the battery holder. Next remove the plastic battery holder by lifting the main board and unhooking the right side from underneath the battery contacts. There are two flat cables to remove. These may or may not have retaining sockets. If they do, simply release the grip as shown. Some consoles just have friction fit sockets. Gently but firmly remove the flat cables. There are also two locking type connectors for the speaker and screen backlight. These have a locking notch, so angle them as you disconnect them from the board. With the main board free of the case, we can put it to one side for the moment. As with many Lynx consoles, the passage of time has seen dust gather up inside the front of the screen, so let's give it a clean. It's spudger time again. By pushing your tool into the slot, you can make the clear front lens pop off of the console. You'll need to flip it over and take care of the bottom as well, of course. With the lens removed, we can clean inside the screen cavity. The inner bezel isn't moulded on, so be sure not to lose it. You can clean inside the screen even if you're not planning on changing the LCD. Nobody wants to stare at a dirty cavity. Now I want to show you my new tool. I got tired of buying cans of air duster so now I use the IT Duster's CompuCleaner Expert. Incredibly powerful dry air dusting without the hassle of cans or compressed airlines. I've popped an affiliate link below because it's handy for those times when you're up to something dirty and you need a quick blow. To remove the existing screen, we have four screws to remove. We'll be reusing these screws, so put them somewhere safe. Goodbye old screen, and thanks. Now that we have the screen out, let's just check that no more dust has settled inside, and give the front of the case a quick dusting. We can now have a quick dust around the buttons and the inner bezel. When replacing the front lens, be sure to match up the power LED on the machine with the printed graphic. The top and bottom will slip in easily, but you might need to persuade the bit on the side. Another quick blow.
and a final dusting. Leaves the front glass looking very good indeed. A small piece of Kapton tape will hold the controls cable safely out of the way. This mount will only fit one way and grips a new screen to the front of the case. The build quality on the screen is superb with nice big solder pads and clear labelling. Don't forget to remove the screen protector before installation. The screen is a very snug fit into the case. Placing the mount over the screen aligns it really well with little room for error. The mount fixes with the four original screen screws. As ever, always back off the screws by turning them anti-clockwise until you feel them drop into the existing thread. The newly mounted screen looks very smart indeed inside the links. The Atari Gamer's mount significantly reduces the possibility of any misalignment. Well done AtariGamer.com! This Lynx has been recapped and the power components have already been upgraded. All we need to do is remove this inductor at L17. See my previous video for power stage upgrading details. The solder points you need are here. This is an easy enough job with a soldering iron, but I'll be using my desoldering station to make lighter work of the task. The inductor simply dropped out. We're going to need 12 wires. I've stripped and I'm pre-tinning them to make the job easier. I measured the path of the wires inside the links and think that roughly 160mm is a reasonable length for the job. Now we apply some liquid flux to the board. Flux helps by dissolving any surface oxidisation that might otherwise prevent the solder flowing onto the joint. This flux is the no-clean variety, so it doesn't leave behind any corrosive residue. If you wish, you can clean it off of isopropyl alcohol. I'm loading the required solder points with a touch of fresh solder. The flux helps the new solder blend well with the existing solder, reducing the time and heat needed to flow. Atari would have used leaded solder back in 1989, so we're using 4060 leaded solder as well. Mixing unleaded and leaded alloys results in bad solder joints. It's time to start attaching the wires. It can be difficult to see which point is which, so I created a graphic with clear labelling. I've used different coloured wires for the sake of clarity in this video. As you can see, the preparation of tinning the wires and fluxing and preloading the solder joints pays off here. The wires fix easily, making solid joints. If any of the wires are protruding from the joints, I simply cut them back with a sharp pair of flush side cutters, making sure any cut ends are removed from the board. To keep our wires neat, I'm going to pop them through this handy piece of shrink tubing. I won't need to heat shrink it, but it will result in a better finish. The wiring on the board is now firmly attached. I've put some polyamide tape over the points. It's an excellent insulator. It's not really needed, but I do like the orange colour. Let's get the other end of the wire soldered to the Ben Ven screen. Some more no clean flux to aid the soldering to the pads on the LCD. 
The backlight connection pad is on the other side of the board. Again, I'm loading the point to be soldered with some fresh solder. Because the wires have already been tinned, this will mean we can make a good solder joint with less time and heat on the solder pads. The bottom pad is labelled as spare, and as such is unused. All of our preparatory work pays off again, and soldering to the pads is quick and easy. Be extra careful of the screen connector ribbon near the bottommost pads. As you can see I'm taking extra care not to touch the ribbon with the side of the soldering iron. Finally, the same process on the backlight pad. Tin and then solder. With all the connections made and the solder joints nice and firm, it's time to reassemble the links. Putting the links back together requires less cabling. We only have one flat cable, this being for the controls of the console. Don't forget the release colour if your links has one. Orientating the mainboard into position allows us to reconnect the speaker connector. We no longer need the other flat cable and power plug for the LCD. Massage your cabling until it feels good. The battery compartment goes back the way it came out. Then place the back of the console back on. Take some time to make sure that the shell is sitting together correctly. If the case is not closing properly, it's usually that the battery holder is not sitting flat inside you might have to pop your fingers in the bottom and give them a wiggle. This is looking really good though, and our earlier air dusting has made a big difference too. A bit more quick screwing before we test out our work. Don't forget to back off the screws and don't over tighten. Finally, we replace the battery compartment cover. Beautiful. The car we're going to use for testing is the classic Chips Challenge. And with the power connected, it's the moment of truth. Success! It's a bit bright in here with my studio lights, so let's do some proper comparisons. This is the old screen with most of the lights off. The camera has a habit of making link screens look better than they actually are in real life. But when we start the game it's evident that the movement is blurred and the contrast is quite poor. This is the Ben Venn screen with most of the lights on. The difference is astonishing. Gameplay is crisp and blur-free. 
The new screen is so bright that the camera is having difficulty exposing the image at the same settings as the old screen. Changing the exposure on the camera shows the image more faithfully to real life experience. Back to the old screen now to show the classic blue lightning. This intro still impresses me even today. The sheer power of the Atari Lynx is amazing in a handheld of that era. Let's do a small gameplay demo so we can see the old screen in action. Again, it looks better through the camera than in real life. When we move to the new screen, the difference is clear crystal clear. Any patterns you see on the screen are not evident in real life, but are camera artefacts from our recording. The display is sharp, responsive, and nothing short of an epic transformation. The Benven screen has eight brightness levels, including off, which cycle by pressing the backlight button. There's also a vertical scanline mode, accessed by holding the brightness button down. Holding this button down once again turns this mode off. Finally, let's have a look at one of my favourites, Zalor Mercenary. This is a great top-down shooter from 1990. The graphics, scrolling and action were brilliant for the time. But it's not until you see the game on a modern Ben Ben screen you realise just how detailed and well animated the game is. So what's my final opinion on the Ben Ven screen for the Atari Lynx Model 2? Well, it's easy to install, the price is right and once you've seen the clarity of the screen, I think it'd be hard for you to go back to the original screen. It's two thumbs up from me. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Much gratitude to Dean Swain from Retro Asylum Podcast for supplying the screen. But for now, we're out of time. Massive thanks to my amazing Patreon supporters. You make these videos possible. If you'd like to help support future videos, then please visit patreon.com forward slash Thanks for watching. Bye.